Right. Tonight, we dive into looking at the Apostle John. We are going to meet our friend, the overachiever, John. He wrote five books in the New Testament. Who can tell me what they are? The easiest one comes first. That's right. Well done. The second easiest one comes next. First through third, John and... I'm impressed. John is referred to in several places as John the Beloved Disciple, John the Evangelist, John the Revelator. So you'll find him in different names in the New Testament. The Gospel of John spotlights Jesus. It's different from the rest of the Gospels. The other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are known as the Synoptic Gospels. They tell similar stories from similar points of view. But the the Gospel of John is different. It's not one of the Synoptic Gospels. It's a Gospel all of its own. And its whole purpose, its primary purpose, is to point out the divinity of Jesus. John spotlights Jesus' divinity more than any of the other Gospels. And he identifies Jesus as the I Am who came in the flesh. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're very similar, but not so with the Gospel of John. In fact, according to one scholar who did the math, 92% of the Gospel of John is unique only to the Gospel of John. Some of the things that we do not find in the Gospel of John, Jesus' birth or childhood, his temptation, any parables, any exorcisms when Jesus heals the leper, the Sermon on the Mount, Peter's confession that he is the, Jesus is the Christ, there's no transfiguration mentioned in the Gospel of John, but here's some things we find only in the Gospel of John. He cleansed the temple early, his ministry in baptism or of baptism in Judea that Jesus baptized. Jesus taught Nicodemus about being born again, the wedding in Cana of Galilee, the Samaritan woman, the I am sayings only found in the Gospel of John, all of those different times when Jesus says, I am. He raised Lazarus from the dead. You would think that'd be in all of them, but only in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. He washed the disciples' feet, the upper room discourse, and continue on and on. So Gospel of John is very different from the rest of the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, and we're going to see why. Now, when I mention to you John, what do you think of? What do you think? <laughs> That's right, Mary. Sister Hay, that was insightful. What do you, th- James's brother, what do you think of when you think of his characteristics, his personality? What do you think of? I heard love. I heard soft. Did somebody say soft? Soft. Love. What else? Follower. So you kind of get this warm, fuzzy idea that John is this soft, warm, loving follower of Jesus. This Bible study, I'm sorry, is going to smash that stained glass window idea of John and show you who he really was. Thankfully, though, he finished up as that soft, warm, fuzzy follower of Jesus. But he did not start that way. John was James' younger brother, that was already said. When you see James, you see John. They were off times with each other. They were one of the, John is likely one of those four burly, bronzed fishermen who went down all the way from, remember this map here? Went all the way down from Bethsaida up here, all the way to the Bethabara down here where John the Baptist was baptizing. John was likely one of those who heard Jesus, or John the Baptist rather, say of Jesus, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The reason we say likely, likely, probably, perhaps, most likely is because John does not refer to himself. He refers to himself as the other disciple, or the disciple Jesus loved. So we guess, and scholars guess, that that's referring to John. However, when Jesus came back up north, he came back from Bethabara. He was into the wilderness and Perea. He came back up north and around the Sea of Galilee, and he found Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They were mending their nets. They were fishermen. They were just about to head in for the day for some sweet tea, and Jesus comes along and says, Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And they forsake family, business, home, everything to follow Jesus. Peter, James, and John formed Jesus' inner circle. Jesus spent more time with, he took them more places, and they saw more miracles than the other nine saw. But that privilege did not mean they were perfect. In fact, John was far from it. We're going to take a look at the highlight reel. If you have your Bible on your, on your phone or in paper, would you turn or click to Mark chapter 9? We're just going to read through this and take a look at it. It's kind of deja vu all over again because we looked at Mark 9 last week. We're going to take a look at Mark chapter 9. Jesus is coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. He was transfigured. He was changed. His clothes were brighter and whiter than the snow. And Jesus only took his special forces. He took Peter, James, and John 
up to the top of that mountain. Here's a photo from last week of the mount, what they believe is Mount Transfiguration, Mount Tabor, which as you can see is a pretty hefty mountain. So it was a pretty hefty trek up that mountain. And while on the top of the mountain, he was transfigured. They walk up the mountain and he's the carpenter turned preacher. They're following after him. But when they get to the top of the mountain, they see something that nobody else saw or they thought they would see. He was absolutely changed. Just brighter than sun. It doesn't take a Harvard grad to realize this man whom they're staring at is divine. And to top off that service on top of that mountain, Moses and Elijah came to church. They came and stood right next to Jesus. And Moses and Elijah had been gone for centuries. But here you have the greatest lawgiver of all time in Moses and the greatest prophet of all time in Elijah standing right next to Jesus. John was standing where death and time stood still. So how would you feel? If you were John, you're on the top of the mountain, it's just Jesus, Peter, James, and you, Moses and Elijah. I want to tell somebody. I got to tell somebody what I just saw. So as they're coming down the mountain, I remember John's reaching in his pocket, grabbing, he's going to go on Twitter. Jesus was transfigured. And Jesus said, oh, put the phone away. Tell the vision to no man till the Son of Man be risen from the dead. How difficult would that be? You just saw Moses. And Jesus says, tell nobody what you just saw. That's got to be tough. I'm no, I'm no good at at keeping good news in. It's easier for me to get a root canal than it is for me to not tell Andrea what I got her for Christmas when I get her something that I think she's really going to like. It's hard for me to wait three weeks till she unwraps it. I'd rather just say, hey, good news, I just bought you. But Peter, James, and John had to keep that in. John had to keep all of that in and not tell anybody. But that whole privilege made John and Peter and James and all of them feel pretty special. Only he and two others saw what they just saw and heard what they just heard. The other nine are down at the foot of the mountain. They're fighting with somebody. They're playing rock, paper, scissors over who has to clean the fish tonight. Peter, James, and John are up there on the mountain and Jesus is transfigured before them. And we know John struggled with pride because just a few verses later after the transfiguration, Jesus asks this question in Mark chapter 9, verse 33. When he came to Capernaum, he was in the house. Jesus asked them, what was it you disputed along the road among yourselves? Jesus knew they were fighting about something. He knew exactly what they were fighting about. So he's not asking for information. He's asking for a confession. But they kept silent. For on the road, they disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And so he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he will be last and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. I always wondered when I look at this story, where did he get a little child? <laughs> When he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me, referring to the Spirit of God. Let me ask you this. Why were they arguing about who's the greatest? What would spawn an argument about who is the greatest? And why? Well, that's true. But let's just focus on Peter, James, and John. Why would they feel like they had a right to assert themselves as greater than anyone else. That's true too. Inner circle, absolutely. Could be that they were related. We learned last week Salome might have been the the sister of Mary or or Mary, the mother of Jesus. But that's what, exactly, they were in the inner circle. Jesus told them here, he said, you're going to sit on thrones, you're going to rule with me. And then he takes them up to a mountain and he shows them this transfiguration. Peter, James, and John feel pretty good about themselves. They feel like we're the inner circle. One of us is going to be the gold medal winner. There's going to be a silver medal. And there's going to be a bronze medal winner. And from the many times Jesus rebukes Peter, he's out of it. He'll probably he'll be bronze. So it's going to be James and John down to gold and silver. So which one is the greatest? Will it be James, the older, or John, the younger? They're fighting about all of this, who's going to be the greatest. And Jesus makes the point very clear. If you want to be a servant, you must become like a little child. If anybody desires to be first, Jesus said, you've got to be last. His kingdom was absolutely backwards. Which brings us to our first lesson. The great ones love others enough to serve others. Jesus spelled greatness S-E-R-V-I-C-E, not R-E-S-P-E-C-T. But he spelled greatness service. 
When he would say, you need to be a minister, he was referring not to a minister, but he was referring to, how can I serve? And James and John didn't quite understand that. So John speaks up. Now this is interesting in John in Mark chapter 9 because this is the only time, first time and only time, in the Synoptic Gospels when John speaks by himself. Other times it's James and John go to Jesus and John and James go. But this time, John speaks by himself. Chapter 9, verse 38. John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. And we forbade him because he does not follow us. So after all this talk of greatness that comes through service, John goes to Jesus and says, Hey, Jesus, just want to let you know there's a guy out there working miracles. He's not part of our group. So we shut him down. We barred the doors. We shut off his electric. We burned his ministerial license. Was that okay? Was that okay that we did that, Jesus? Just, that's good, right? I don't think John wanted to admit it. But he was promoting something very dangerous. John was promoting... sectarianism sectarianism is a, cu a cousin to prejudice sectarianism says this if you want to be anybody you've got to be a part of our group so John just comes to Jesus and Jesus said Jesus he's not with us so I shut him down so let me ask you this let me ask this section right here what did this guy do that would warrant one of Jesus' delta force to come and shut him down. What was he doing wrong? This guy who was working miracles in Jesus' name. What was he doing wrong, Brother Spen? Nothing. You're absolutely right. He was doing nothing wrong. And yet John looked at him and said, wait a minute, you're not part of the body? You're not part of this body? Then you're not part of the body. And Jesus had to rebuke him and tell this silver or gold medal winner that just because he's not part of this body, that doesn't necessarily mean he's not part of the body. John wanted to rebuke him because he was not a part of the twelve. And Jesus says this in Mark 9, 39, Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. Jesus says, if they're not against me, they're for me. So let me ask you a very pointed question. How will you respond when denominational churches receive the Holy Ghost just like us? It's a good response. How would John have responded when the denominational churches received the whole? If John was in this church, how would he respond? He'd go down and knock on their door. Uh-uh. Not in this house. Not at all. How would Jesus respond? Thank God. Thank me. <laughs> so I ask this question, well, are we going to be more like John and say if they're not part of this body... They're not part of the body. Or will we be like Jesus and say, the more the merrier. I love our church. I love our doctrine. I love our faith. And I love our city. So let me tell you what my prayer request has been lately. My prayer request has been for the Holy Ghost to fall on every church in our city. I'm thankful when the Holy Ghost falls in this sanctuary. But I believe the Holy Ghost needs to fall on denominational sanctuaries. And so my prayer is... They don't have to be a part of this body to be a part of the body. What makes us a part of the body is that we've been born again. That we have the revelation of the mighty God in Christ. We know who Jesus is. We've experienced His salvation. Not only the name on the building, but the fact that we've been born again. That's what makes us a part of the body and a part of the bride. So my prayer is that there would be none of this, but there would be all manner of people in this church praying for churches and other areas of our city and other denominations to receive the Holy Ghost just like we have. We studied already what happened with Peter when he went to Cornelius' house 
And he didn't think if you're part of this body, you can't be a part of the body. And God said, watch me pour out the Holy Ghost on a Roman centurion and his entire house. And I'll wow you because I'll do it for them just like I did it for you, Peter. I believe God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I believe God is going to do that all over this city and this county simply because he wants to. And I believe he wants them to receive what we have and not just to keep it to ourselves. John was, we mentioned earlier, somebody was saying how he was soft. What appeared that John was passive. But John was far from passive. In fact, he was pretty aggressive. John was competitive. Brother Scott said that. John was one of those guys where if you played him in ping pong and he lost, he'd be one of those guys, all right, here, no, 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 two out of three, let's go. And he lost, yeah, come on, four out of seven, let's go, let's do this. Uh, that's right, 51 out of 100, we're going to get this, come on, let's go. John was competitive. He didn't take kindly to outsiders claiming to have what he had because he's part of the inner circle. He's part of the privileged three. So there's no way that guy down the street could be preaching the same and have the same power that John has. And Jesus let him know, absolutely. If they're not against me, they're for me. John was heavy on zeal and light on love. Which is ironic, isn't it? John is the beloved disciple. He's the one Jesus loved. That's how he referred to himself. And yet early on in his ministry, John is heavy on zeal and he's incredibly light on love. He ran low on love toward that fellow believer who was working miracles and toward the unbelieving Samaritans. Do you remember them from last week? The Samaritans? John and James, they head into the city. Jesus says, get ready. We'll just prepare a path. And they go into the city and the Samaritans look at them and fold their arms and shake their heads and say, not in this town. You Jews aren't coming through our city. The John and James being rejected by the Samaritans come back to Jesus and John, you know, Jesus, they can't treat you like that. It ought not be like that. They can't do that to you. You're God. They can't treat you like that. And so they ask him in the, que in the question in Luke 9, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just like Elijah did? That was John and James together. And then Jesus turns to them and rebukes them. He had to rebuke his disciples an awful lot. He said, you don't know what manner of spirit you're of. You've got all kinds of zeal, John, but you've got very little love. Son of man didn't come to destroy, but to save they went to another village. Two short stories. John is ready to burn down the unbelievers and shut down the other believers. Jesus had to correct John's understanding of why he came. I didn't come to destroy. I came to save. And that unbalanced zeal, that imbalanced zeal without the love, earned James and John the nickname Sons of Thunder. Anybody remember the other translation for Sons of Thunder? That's okay. Boanerges, but there's another translation for Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder almost sounds like a first century Batman and Robin. It sounds like a, like a, but there was another translation. It was Sons of, starts with a T. Does anybody remember what it was from last week? I know you've slept since then. But I'm going to go ahead and start and see if you can get it. Tumult, very good. The tumultuous ones, Sons of Tumult. And the reason they were the sons of tumult is because they were causing all the tumult. They were the tumultuous ones. They thundered without thinking. So after Jesus does the discourse of you've got to be a servant, you must be the last if you want to be the first, if you want to be great, you've got to be like a child. You do, he does all of that. He goes through all of that. James and John still can't get it right. They still get their mother, Salome, to bake Jesus a pomegranate pie and ask him, would it be okay if my sons were your vice president and secretary of state? Would it be okay if my sons sat on your left and on your right in your kingdom? Would that be all right? They still don't get it. John and James, both, but focusing on primarily on John tonight. Oh, well, that's just sad. It worked really well last time. John and James, both, but focusing on John tonight, had this equation. They had ambition without humility, and that equals egotism. All the ambition in the world, no humility, and they were just egotists. We want to be the greatest. Nothing wrong with wanting to be great, as long as it's for the right reason. I want to be great to bring glory to God, not to me. They were asking through their mother 
Can we sit on your right? Can we sit on your left? Can we be right next to you? Nothing wrong with wanting to be next to Jesus. As long as your motive is not, I want to be next to you so everybody looks up and says, wow, look at James and John. They're, they're, they're somebody. So, ambition without humility equals egotism. We know John's not blessed with humility because on the last night of Jesus' life, not one of those twelve, not even John, warm, fuzzy, loving John, had the humility to pick up a towel in a basin and wash anybody's feet. Everybody was sitting there waiting to be served. No mad dash for the towel. And Jesus served them. Every one of them. Knowing in just a few short hours, every one of those pairs of feet would run away from him. So that's John. Really sorry to crush the stained glass window image we've had of this loving, soft, gentle John. But that's John. That's what Jesus has to work with if Jesus is going to work with John. All zeal, little love. All ambition, no humility. So did it ever change for John? And if it did, how? Somewhere between the Last Supper and the cross, something softened in John. And we start to see the glimpses of the man we thought we saw. John was among those who fled with a mob. When the, swords, the mob of the swords came in the garden, he fled from the mob. But John came back. John stood with Peter in the courtyard. When only Peter and John, at least the Bible records, only Peter and John came back to the courtyard to see what would happen to Jesus. Jesus is in the courtyard, or he's in the building, being tried unjustly, but tried nonetheless. And Peter and John are just kind of peeking and peering inside. And of course, at that point, that's when the girl comes up and asks Peter, Hey! And Peter, no, 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 and he's gone. But John hangs around. We, don't have, we have no idea really where Peter went that night or the other ten. We know where Judas went, but we don't, the other ten. But John hangs around. In fact, so much so that John is the only disciple that's mentioned in the New Testament who was at the cross. Of the, the eleven that remain, only John was at the cross. Because Jesus called to him on the cross. And he looked exactly. He looked at his mom and said, Mom, he's going to take care of you. John, you take care of my mom. Jesus trusted his own mother to the care and keeping of John. And tradition tells us that John took Mary into his own home and took care of her like his own mother until she passed away. What softened John? I believe what softened John was nothing less than Calvary. John stood there at the foot of the cross and watched as the man he followed for three and a half years died for him and then forgave everybody who crucified him. And at that point, perhaps at that point and that point only, do we find out what really softened John. And John realized that that is greatness not being called Lord or sitting in a place of power or position of authority but that that is greatness Peter and John were the only two disciples who came to the empty tomb right after Jesus rose it's, a, it's neat the Bible refers to it it's in the book of John chapter 20 the Bible refers to Peter went running to the tomb. John went running to the tomb, although the Bible calls him the other disciple, but we know it's John. John went running to the tomb, and John stopped, for some reason, stopped at the empty tomb. And Peter just <laughs> ran right in. But John just kind of stopped and peered in. But they were the only two disciples who were at the empty tomb to see that it was, in fact, absolutely empty. And take a look at a few of John's rough edges. John MacArthur in his book, Twelve Ordinary Men, which is a fantastic read, and we have in the library, by the way. So if you'd like to check it out, you can. It's in the library. Not this version, but the other one. <laughs> Calls them imbalances. And so we're going to take a look and see if those were ever smoothed out. The first of all are love and truth. John was light on love, heavy on truth. Light on love, heavy on zeal. His love for truth shines through in the gospel and his epistles. 
He spoke the word truth 25 times in the gospel. He spoke the word truth 20 times in the epistles, giving him a total of 45 times. John was heavy on truth. Nobody else in the New Testament saved Jesus. Exalted truth higher than John. According to MacArthur, though, another one of these equations, truth without love is brutality. But love without truth is hypocrisy. Remember, Mark so kindly volunteered, and I won't ask you to do it again, to show us the the need for balance. If all we ever have is truth, and we have no love, then we're brutal. We just beat people over the head with truth. If all we have is love without truth, then we're hypocritical. We don't have any of the power we claim to have because we have to have the truth. So there's got to be a balance between those two. John, at the beginning of his life, was heavily heavy on truth. But as we find out toward the end of his life and later on in his life, John struck a beautiful balance between love and truth. He even spoke in his epistles about speaking about righteousness and love. And he would write to others and he would use truth and love in the same sentence but in the gospel and his epistles I don't know if he was making up for lost time or what John this is truth John writes of love 80 times I believe this transformed John from all this to realizing this plus this equals true discipleship. If we have the truth, and we do, thank God we do. And if we have love, and I believe we do, and thank God we do. People, when they come in here, they will hear the truth, and they will feel love, and they will find a family, a church family, who cares for them just like Jesus cares for them. I pray we can strike that holy balance to love truth and to love people, and then to tell them the truth in love. Secondly, ambition and humility. John was heavy on ambition. We saw that earlier, and he was light, if had any, humility at all. So did that ever change? Throughout his gospel, John never once mentions his own name. He could have. He could have drawn direct attention to himself. Remember, he was part of Jesus' Delta Force. But he always referred to himself as the other disciple of the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, when I read that, that sounds arrogant to me. Who are you? Oh, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. That sounds kind of arrogant. Until you read John 13, and John himself wrote that Jesus loved all the disciples. So it's not, he loves me, doesn't love you. It could be that he was so amazed by Jesus' love that John's entire identity was wrapped up in remembering Jesus loves me. Rather than I'm the disciple in the inner circle, I'm the disciple who saw the transfiguration. I'm the disciple whom Jesus told things he didn't tell anyone else. John just says, I'm the disciple Jesus loved. He loved me. A man who wanted to burn up the Samaritans, shut down the believers. A man who wanted to be the greatest. A man who fled from him in the garden. He loved me. He was so wrapped up in being the disciple whom Jesus loved. Right? So it could be that his identity was wrapped up in Jesus' love. I think that's a good way to see ourselves. I'm not only Andrea's husband. I'm not only Mac and Ray's dad. Not only your pastor. I'm LJ. I'm a disciple. Jesus loves. You should see yourself the same way. You're not only the guy at work, the girl at the counter, the, the person down the street. You're a disciple. Whom Jesus loves. In his letters, John doesn't call him his pedigree or special status. John calls himself a fellow brother and fellow child of God. When he writes to the church, he calls her the elect lady. And he calls the church little children. John speaks. He begins to We see this soft John. He speaks with a gentleness and a tenderness that only comes from the heart God has touched. And in his last book, in the last book of the Bible, he calls himself your brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Somewhere in his life, John's ambition was tempered by humility. 
And he learned to strike a holy balance between the two. The last one I want to mention is glory and suffering. John's last battle he fought with balance was between glory and suffering. Where do you see his thirst for glory? Absolutely. Where do you see his aversion for suffering? He's willing to glory with him. Where do we see he's not willing to suffer with him? The cro- well, the, the garden, where he flees from everybody in the garden. Nobody, unless they're just, they may have some light psychosis, wants to suffer with anybody for anything. But John was not willing to suffer, however, he wanted glory, which is normal. But Jesus was teaching him a lesson that we need to learn, that you can't have glory without the suffering, sometimes. In fact, many times, suffering is the open door to glory. We're going to wrap up the series of Beatitudes very soon. We're on the last one. Does anybody know what the last, the, the eighth Beatitude is, the very last one in Matthew 5? It's the pinnacle of Christianity pinnacle of discipleship in Jesus' eyes. The summit, you've reached it. Does anybody know what it is? Blessed are those who are persecuted. Jesus sees persecution. Or I should say, Jesus sees willing to be persecuted for His name's sake as the summit of Christianity. True Christians don't ask for it, but if they are, are willing to suffer for him. It's the height of Christian character. Paul wrote in Romans 8, 17, if we're children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If we suffer with him, we will be glorified together. Christians will suffer, but thank God Paul wrote, for I consider that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. We may all suffer, but if we do, God will reveal glory that far outshines the suffering. Suffering and glory are like Siamese twins. John wanted one of the chief seats, the glory. And Jesus said, you can be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. That seat's going to come at a high price, kind of like a Buckeyes home game. If you want that seat, you can have it. But it's going to cost you dearly. And John says, I can drink of that cup. So Jesus gives him a drink. When he and Peter were jailed for preaching the name of Jesus in Acts 4, from there revival spreads and throws his persecution And John takes another drink of that bitterness when James, his own brother, dies as the first disciple to die as a martyr. And then another, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another, until every disciple was executed. And John lost every one of his close friends. And now it's John's turn. The Roman emperor Domitian hates the Christians, so he captured John. According to history, this is not in the Bible. But according to history, John, the Roman emperor Domitian, sentenced John to execution by boiling him alive in oil. But the story goes, when he was plunged into the boiling oil, it did not hurt him. And he preached inside that pot of oil the whole time. It's kind of like a New Testament version of the three Hebrew children. And then history records Domitian forced John to drink poison. But it did not hurt him. Kind of like Jesus promised in Mark 16. So he's frustrated and he's humiliated. And Domitian sentenced John to exile on the island of Patmos. That's Patmos. What surrounds the island of Patmos? Sharks sharks indeed. (laughs) What else? Lots and lots of water and more sharks. You can see it's surrounded by the sea. As you can see, here's the island of Patmos according to the map. It's right there. Nowhere near land. So Patmos was really a modern day Alcatraz. That's Alcatraz. That's freedom. Not freedom. Freedom. Where John was, where everybody else was. And he was exiled to the island of Patmos. Cut off from everybody. But it was on that island God gave him the visions that would be recorded as the book of Revelation. But John did not die on Patmos. After Domitian came the emperor Trajan. And he released John from prison, brought him back to the mainland, and he lived out his last few days in Ephesus, where it's believed he used to pastor the church Paul founded in Ephesus. One of the neatest 
stories about John. History records he was so frail he had to be carried to church. He couldn't walk to church. He had to be carried after he came back from Patmos. But as they were carrying him, he kept muttering one phrase over and over and over and over. Say it, Sister Hay. Go ahead. Sister Hay printed out the notes. I think it's so great. He, he kept muttering over and over, my little children love one another. My little children love one another. My little children love one another. And somebody finally asked him, he said, why are you saying that? And he responded, it is the Lord's command. And if this alone be done, it is enough. Jesus' love transferred this son of tumult into the beloved disciple. And the disciple Jesus loved lived his last days by his last words. My little children love one another. John was a fascinating, fascinating disciple. Showing us that what God can do through the power of the cross can change the hardest heart into the softest heart and use somebody for his glory. I want to hit the highlights just very quickly. And go through just a quick recap and take a look at the highlight reel for John. John James, or John rather, was called by Jesus. He was part of his inner circle. He was nicknamed the son of thunder. He and James wanted to call down fire from heaven. He and James wanted places of power. <laughs> he and James wanted a lot. He wrote five books of the New Testament. He was the only disciple at the cross. He was with Peter at the empty tomb. He pastored the church in Ephesus. Domitian exiled him to the island of Patmos. And he died in Ephesus at nearly 100 years old. John is the only one who did not die a martyr's death, but he died of natural causes in Ephesus. Any questions about John? The disciple Jesus loved. Mama? He was just, he was in his 90s. He was so frail and aged that he couldn't walk. Yep. Fascinating, fascinating disciple. 